Few former players have made a smoother transition to life in the media than Matthew Lloyd. It seems the former Essendon champ quickly formed the view he could spend the rest of his working life in the game he loves as a commentator. And we're all better informed as a result. Welcome, Matthew. Thanks, Mike. Thanks for having me. I heard you on 3RW recently declare yourself a journo. That's a bold declaration from a player recently retired, given what players think of the media while they're involved. Yeah, I, Mike, it's interesting. I didn't think a lot of uh, some media people when I was playing the game, and it's amazing how I've changed uh, my thought process on that since I've been in it for the last seven years. You know, I, I took so many things personally as a player about what... <laughs> I know that. Like what you said about me and uh, what Wolsey, I think, gave me my biggest whack back in 1999 when I was a young player coming through, and you know, I didn't, don't think I forgave Wolsey for about five years for that <laughs> one, but now I realise um, what I'm doing now. It's never personal on the player or the team. It's just an opinion at that time. But you didn't think that, did you? you, you oh, no. No. And, and players don't, do they? Because I think you're under siege, aren't you? And, and then suddenly you pick the paper up and you're the target of a, of a negative story. That's exactly right. You, you're under siege. Uh, you're under the pressure. Uh, you're walking into a football club uh, and you, know, you feel like everyone's staring at you. You walk out of training and you've got fans saying, uh, what's going wrong with you, mm. with your form? Or you've got fans saying, don't worry about what everyone's saying about you. So I became mm. a recluse at one stage of my really? career because I was so embarrassed about yeah. how I was playing. What I admire about your yeah. stuff in print, I think in all the mediums, but definitely in print, there was a column recently on Travis Clark. Yeah. And I mean, you do lay yourself mm. bare. I, I, I sort of read that and I read it twice because you were so mm. personal. I mean, there was so much hurt from you and how you could sort of um, relate that to Travis Clark's situation. Yeah, it's uh, probably the biggest response I've ever had to a column, and uh, it was just the human element of my story. And you know, I, I've often thought of Travis as hard as I am in my media role. Uh, I've been thinking of Travis all year because it's taken me back to 2008 and 2009, my two toughest years in the game when I was questioning whether I still had the ability to play the game anymore and how I actually saw a, um, a family counsellor and within... 10 minutes of speaking to the family council, I was just crying, yeah. telling him, pouring out my heart to a guy that, you know... Was that the I'm, priest? The priest, yeah. 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 And uh, the, my wife's family set it up. They knew I was just uh, a shadow of the person I was. I was miserable. Uh, you know, I'd lost total f uh, faith in my ability. And uh, they, they knew something had to change. And they, they, they and I needed to talk because I, I, my, my way was to say, no, I'm fine, I'm mm. fine. But deep down, everyone, though my family knew I wasn't. And, and I wrote a column about that in relation to Travis Cloak. And uh, I had um, players get in touch with me uh, about it. I had football managers say he's giving it to, giving it to all their staff because the, the club's under siege at the yeah. moment. So it was great to have that uh, feedback from a column. It's an emotional game, yeah. isn't it? We forget that sometimes. We, yeah. we treat you blokes just in a clinic, in a scientific sense. Yeah. How come he's not doing this mm. when he's got all these attributes? But we forget about what happens in the heart and the head. Yeah, yeah, and I've, even Jake Stringer, there's been feedback on his performance the last few weeks, and some people have said to me, you know, Matthew, he's carrying a shoulder injury, and you shouldn't be going as hard as you are on Jake Stringer, but probably the footballer in me, I knew once I crossed the white line, didn't matter what injury I was carrying, there was never any, you can, can't make any excuses for your body mm. because you, once you cross the white line, you, you're fair game really. And um, as I said, I take no enjoyment out of crit criticising a player or critiquing a player hard, but it's a job It's a job that you've got to do for the, your employee. The thing I like about what you do in the mm. media, there are no sacred cows. Mm. And I really admire that. I mean, because you're not long out of the game. Yeah. There are blokes playing who you are friends with and played with. Uh, and the most recent example, I was watching uh, Footy Classified and you took on Lethal. I mean, no one challenges Lee Matthews. Uh, there, was a, there was a view about he expressed about what the Bulldogs had done with their players before a Geelong game. Let's remind you about what, uh, how that transpired. Who's for Lee Matthews to tell him what he can and can't do yeah. with his playing group? No one likes arguing with Lee, yeah, though, do they? As we've so found to our peril on weekends. But I, I well, think... Um, who's, who's Lee, Lee Matthews is one of the greatest, if not the greatest, names in the history of the game. He's entitled to a view, isn't he? Yeah, of course yeah, he is. Yeah, and Matthews saying Lee, he doesn't Luke, agree. Did, Luke didn't want to challenge Lee's view there. But I'm saying, when you... if you Talk you've had, for a day's hardly Geelong for a and day. You, you've had the fun. toughest week where players have seen a player break his leg hor horrifically. You've had a player do a knee. Taking your players away for a day, I think it's a great idea. It didn't work for them, but, uh, yeah, it's hard for Lee to you know, tell a coaching group what they can and can't and also do. He... Matty... When you, because you're very well prepped, mm. you always have been. When you were thinking about that, did it trouble you that you were going to be criticising 
this icon? Uh, not at all, Mike. Not at all. I, I find that uh, I work with Lee on 3OW on Saturdays and we have a great relationship. And he said, if you genuinely believe what you've got to say and you, you've, got, you've got a basis for that uh, opinion, go for it. And no one should be sacred. And it's interesting that it was about Lee in that yeah. regard. And Lee, I worked with four days later. I, I thought about it as soon as I saw him. I wonder if Lee's going to bring it up. He never brought it up. Never so, brought it up. No, I think. And Lee you understands. chose to leave it. Sit. I didn't say anything <laughs> either. But uh, no, I don't think. You know, Mike. Um, you know, there should be anyone that, that's sacred. You know, I, I like to think that I'm balanced and uh, opinionated on, on all things. And uh, yeah, you know, I like to give good feedback, bad yeah. feedback, and uh, that's just that's just me. Have you lost any friends? People you'd regard as friends because of what you've said publicly about them? Uh, no, no, I haven't. Oh. I, I must admit, you know, I walked away. I remember Sam Newman saying once, you're lucky to walk away from the game with more than four, four true friends. Genuine friends, yeah. And that's spot on. I, I, I'm, I have a lot of great acquaintances with the Essendon Football Club, but I only have three or four guys that I've really stayed in touch with closely. Which category is James Hurd in? Uh, James was never someone that I socialised with. You played 10 years of footy game. with him? Yeah, I did. And we had, I wouldn't have had a better rapport on field with a player than James. Uh, we roomed together on every footy trip and we got on great. But James was, a, James was uh, doing a stock joke, a stockbroking degree. He had a marketing business. So I didn't hang out with James like I hung out with the other players outside of footy. But we, had a, we have a good relationship. But we just don't call each other, don't hang out. But whenever we bump into each other, we, we get on well. So you're an acquaintance? Yeah. 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 When's the last time you spoke to Hurdy, Matt? Oh, when I probably did the coaching role, which so which I was that was teaching Joe Danaher, Joe, Joe Danaher 2015. How Titans. did that not continue? I'm staggered by this. Joe Danaher is clearly an outstanding young yeah. teller, right? And he just as clearly can't kick from set shots within mm. 40 metres. Yeah, and, and you could do all that. Yeah, uh, it's something that uh, I was able to do, but teaching is another story. You know, Joe had probably five flaws in his kicking, which I discovered quite early. I might have it might have taken me a month. To, to fix one floor and then I'd start on the next one. So it was a really, really tough challenge and the one that I couldn't quite nail was his ball drop, his yep. hand flops out and it was a really tough thing. We trialled a number of different things but why I didn't continue with the role is my media is my is 99% uh, what I, my role and that was probably, you know, a 1%. You know, I was maybe putting six or seven hours in a week. It was an itch I wanted to scratch, the coaching side of it, and I, I see goal kicking as a real area that just they don't coach properly. So I had different ideas of how I would coach, and that was with fatigue, putting players under pressure, which I don't think they do well enough. And it got to about round 17, and when I was broadcasting Danaher and Essendon, the cameras were panning on me. I was, my heart was beating in my chest with every kick he was having. If he kicked one, it was, a, it was adrenaline. If he missed one, uh, you're half embarrassed because you felt you, I take yeah. responsibility for that. But my problem was James Heard under siege. Uh, I was on footy classified, and I got asked three or four shows: should James Heard be sacked as a coach of Essendon? I didn't want to dud my show, uh, but I also knew I was going to be on the training track with James Heard um, the next day. Mm. So I was walking into Essendon training the next day, thinking, I wonder what James Heard thought of me. Some days he wouldn't say hello to me. And I'm thinking, mm. is James just in another world through the pressure he's under or is he actually disappointed with what I said last night? So What he was the answer? Well, he, I think it was more that he was in a haze pretty much for his last second half of his year through the pressure he was under and media camped out in front of his house. I think it was that more so than anything I said. When you had your problems early on in your career with your yeah. kicking, what did you do about it? I... Uh, what happened was, uh, it was on the eve of, uh, I think, the 2000 final series. I think I kicked, uh, that year, 100, 105? 105 goals, 60-something. Yep. So I wasn't the safest kick, and uh, I think we, we'd lost one game. Um, Robert Shaw was a bad cop for Kevin Sheedy, and mm. I think he wanted to give a wake-up call to everyone, don't be complacent. And he said to me in front of the whole team, you don't practice anywhere near as much as Jason Dunstall or Tony Lockett does. You are going to cost us a big final with mm. the way you kick for goal. And uh, it uh, cut me badly and deeply. And uh, I thought to myself, he's probably right. So it was sort of um, around that time that I got a sports psychologist. I had um, David Whedon was at the football club previously. Um, and and I worked with Dave. I would bang on David Whedon's door uh, just, you know, 
every day of the week nearly and say, David, can you come out with me mm. and work on my technique? I used to stab at the football, I had a high ball drop and a sports psychologist to help me with the mental side of it. So, uh, and so and it was amazing. Just I found that I became bulletproof in the space of an off-season uh, with my goal kicking from that point on. This sounds highly improbable, Matthew, but mm. the source is impeccable. Did Kevin Sheedy order you to stay on the ground mm. at halftime in an Anzac Day game and practice your kicking? Yeah, he did. He did. Uh, <laughs> it's a true story. Uh, I would have been at that game. I've no memory of that. So you, you had, well, the other blokes yeah. went into the rooms mm. for the break. You were out on the ground kicking. Yeah, it must have been the, you know, my first year was 95, so I reckon it was maybe, maybe 96, 97. And uh, I kicked maybe three or four points, some bad shots, and we're walking in as a team. And he tapped me on the shoulder and said, don't bother coming in to listen to me. You'd be better off having your shots at halftime, having a bit more practice. And I was more nervous at the <laughs> halftime break than I was uh, during the game because uh, everyone was uh, heckling me, mm. uh, jeering me, and uh, I didn't actually have a shot after halftime because I was, I was too really? scared so you didn't to have want another the footy. shot. And, I went through many stages through my career where I didn't want the next shot because of okay. that, yeah, that mental demon that I had. Uh, not in the back half of my career, but many times through that early period. I remember kicking 2-7 against the uh, Fremantle Dockers at, at Waverley, and I remember just breaking down. I, I drove home, uh, got home, my parents said, you, how are you feeling about today? And it just, un because of the kicking 2-7, just... Uh, Unforgivable, but I knew my technique just wasn't good enough. So it's probably my biggest, one of my biggest joys that I turned being a 50-50 kick early on to becoming a safe kick late in my career. 2001, you kicked okay. Yeah. But you played, I think, 21 games. You kicked 105 goals. Now, that's mm. clearly an average of five a game. Yeah. Magnificent performance. Yeah, I think it's a, probably the best a season of football that I ever had. Um, you know, to, I felt you know, strong, like powerful in the marking contest, and I felt explosive off the mark and I was part of a team that was a very good side to play in. Mm. So, um, you know, was no doubt uh, that year was the best individual season that I ever had. Got reported on three or four occasions uh, that year. Oh, which, that's yeah, the, yeah, the well, velvet... Uh, I think, I think uh, through... Who, who yeah. termed you the velvet uh, uh, Eddie Maguire on the footy show, I think yeah. it was, and then Sam Newman loved it. Was and, it justified? Uh, yes, yes, it was. Um, I went through a period in 1998 where, you know, I was on the rise as a young footballer. I, Never had any setbacks really as a junior footballer, um, you know, making teams and being all Australian, getting on an Essendon list at 16, debuting at 17, uh, and then I started to play some good football. And I remember Stephen Critiel just tormented me <laughs> at um, the Witten Oval, held me to I reckon three possessions in the day, pinching, punching. Dean Wallace was sent by Sheeds to try and get in between us. And uh, I remember after the game, Sheeds tapped Wallace and Harvey on the shoulder and said, can you take him into that room over there? And I thought he was going to give me some encouragement, say, don't worry about it, everyone goes through it. And both Wallace and Harvey said, if you handle tough, strong fullbacks the way you did today, for, uh, for the rest of your career, like, you'll be out of the game mm. very shortly. So you've got to toughen up, like toughen up. And so I, I always loved the hip and shoulder. I, I grew up loving Ablett Senior and Wayne Carey. And so I thought to myself, I've got to fight fire with fire. And um, I started going for hip and shoulders and I, I, I had the bad technique where I'd, I'd raise the um, elbow come up. Yep. a bit too often, so I lost four weeks for it. But Sheeds never said, you're letting the team down. He just said, um, you know, keep going for it. You're changing the way people yeah. are viewing it. So it wasn't just critical, was it? I mean, it was Mickey Martin was playing at North. Yeah, Mickey Martin. Andrew Dunkley. I, and Andrew Dunkley was kicking me in the shins What's for a period of time really? there. Oh, yeah, yeah. Been in the shins. There was, I remember uh, Jamie Shanahan was there. Even uh, Ben Graham, who you wouldn't say is no. the toughest player, he came down and was having a crack. And, and then I remember one day I was walking to my position and uh, big Paul Bullis had the long hair. <laughs> he was charging at a million miles an hour and he just oh, came off with scratches, all over my body and I kicked four goals that day and I thought to myself I actually got through one of the toughest days I've ever had and I'd made some comments on the footy show that Thursday night which I'd been told Terry Wallace put on the board for the team to say this smart smarter Alec yeah, has yeah. made some comments hey, hey let's give it to him today and I was walking to my position and Paul Broderick said you'll be lucky to um, walk <laughs> off the ground today. Really? And that's what I think set me back in my media back then because I went, was so gun-shy after that day 
to ever say anything again. Mm. I became uh, very bland. I didn't want to say anything too much. And you were hard to get in here, though. Yeah, yeah, all because of that day. Yeah. I think. The other, you had another moniker too, Matthew, that mm. you were less fond of, uh, Pretty Boy Lloyd. Yeah. yeah. Didn't like that, did you? No, I, I didn't um, because, you know, I, I probably never wanted to be seen as a... Tom Cruise? Uh, yeah, Pretty Boy player, really. I wanted to be known as a courageous uh, play-the-ball player. I know I, I staged for free kicks and I... I um, you know, had that in my game, which was something now I'm not proud of through that period. But I always felt like I'd play in front, cop punches to the back of the head. I'd stand under packs for my team for 15 years. So pr pretty boy Lloyd. It was just something Sam Newman liked to say, mm. but something that I didn't really like too much. You told him, didn't you? Yeah, I did. Mm. I did. And uh, I, he was probably half embarrassed that I didn't like it and all that sort of thing. But Obviously, it's a bit of fun from Sam's end, but it's something that I never really liked too much, no. What about the staging? And I think yeah. I think the critical comments about you and staging were valid, mm. in my view. Yeah. Do you accept that? Yeah, I'll accept that, yeah. yeah. I uh, got into a bad habit, uh, bad habit um, through early 2001. And I remember um, we, we played Richmond uh, late in 2001 in round 22 and then the final series. And I remember David Whedon, who'd then joined Richmond, I don't know who he said it to, but it became back page news uh, that my staging, um, you know, the umpires were getting conned by the, the staging and all those sorts of things. And so I wouldn't have got a free kick, I reckon, from that point on. I lived with that, but I knew that it'd have to be a pretty uh, dramatic head high push for me to get any free kick. But like I, I wrote about Lindsay Thomas mm. um, recently, I said, you know, if you're a good enough player, you get through it. You don't. If any free kick, you get's a bonus, really. So don't go playing for them. And I tried my hardest to stop that stigma in the latter part of my career. It stays with you forever, unfortunately. But it's never something that I ever wanted to to be be known as. When we come back, Matthew, let's talk about that dramatic end to your playing career. I've spoken to you before about the way you exited football, mm. and I feel it's a bit sad. Yeah. It's not a view that you mm. share, but let's revisit that fateful game, Essendon Hawthorne at the MCG and the big collision with Brad Sewell. Did you go for him? I, I went for him, yeah. But uh, I, what happened was, uh, Mike, I'd missed four or five weeks leading into that game with a heel injury and I knew I wanted to retire from the game. So I thought to myself, I, I can't retire um, having not played for five weeks and I just tell the football world and Essendon and all my teammates that I'm... I'm done. I want to run out on the MCG in a game where if we win, we play finals. If Hawthorne win, they play finals. What a great way to mm. get back out in the field and play. I wasn't 100% right. Probably shouldn't have played with this injury. And we were, an Achilles for that. Uh, yeah, an Achilles heel injury. And I remember um, they had no Franklin. He'd decked Ben Cousins with a head high bump the week before. And a number of other players were out. I think Roughhead was out as well. And I remember we were down by 22 points. Just played with no life in this first half. I'd had four disposals, playing terribly. Matthew Knight just ripped the paint off the walls with his spray. A lot of it directed at me uh, about my performance. We're walking up the race at half time to run out for the third quarter and Nathan Lovett Murray tapped me on the shoulder and he said, I know you're hurting. Like, mm -hmm. the, I can feel, you're grimacing every time you go for the ball. He said, you're a big body, just your pressure, just your pressure inside 50. Uh, it would really, I think, lift the group. So I, I started on the top of the square at three-quarter time. Your call or, or my the, call. the coach? Your I, call. I was playing half forward, yep. but my call was to charge in at Sam Mitchell because he was getting the, the hits out the back uh, and he had 20-odd to half time. So my goal was for the ball to be hit to Mitchell and I'd hit him with a bone-crunching tackle, which would take the stuffing out of him, hurt his ribs. You know, that was my aim to uh, for that start. And it just happened that... Mark McVeigh won the clearance and the ball dribbled forward. And I remember I had a split-second decision. The ball's like bouncing in between the distance that you and I are sitting. And I made the decision to hip and shoulder down the front. Didn't want to make head contact. And my shoulder, unfortunately, hit his cheekbone. This and is Sully we're Sewell, talking about, yeah. And, I, and I could see his fingers were motioning of someone severely hurt. And, but then I had to go into survival mode at that stage mm. with them coming at me from all directions. You, you've said to me previously that when you hit him, it was like he was in a car accident. Yeah. He just recoiled. Yeah, he did. Yeah, yeah he did. And, um, yeah, I split second again. I looked at him, but as I said, they were coming at me from all angles. Hodge, Brown, Lewis, some tough yeah. players. And um, Sam Mitchell, I remember Sam coming up and he's 
what have you done? Like mm. you just saw in his face, just seeing what I'd just done. And I was rattled, you know, I, I knew what I was trying to do, but the last thing I ever wanted, I wanted to, you know, as I said, hurt him down the front and win him and, and try and make a statement that, from the team. Is that honest? Or yeah. were you angry, so angry, that you, you didn't care and no. you were just going to no, run no, through it? No, I never wanted to make head high contact in, in that. Because I, I wanted to play finals the, mm. the next week, so no, last thing I wanted to do was just throw away any chance I had of playing. And, um, you know, so obviously all hell broke loose there <laughs> for a while and um, got the team in and, Mark McVeigh got. I was wasn't saying much because my my instinct was what have I done here and also I've just played. I'm playing my last game mm. of football, so I was in a bit of a haze. And Mark McVeigh took it and said, "That was unbelievable. The captain's just made a statement for us. Let's back him up now, protect him, and let's go on and win this game of football." And we kicked the next seven goals. Wow. And so, some people say, "Are you embarrassed? Are you proud?" I never ever wanted that to happen to Brad Sewell, but the response that action happened for my team, I'm proud of. So some people might not like that, but it got a reaction um, for my team at that time. Did you square it up with Sully? Have you crossed yeah. paths with him? Yeah, so I um, saw him on the ground after the game. I, um, I rang him two days later. He, he just said, no problems, thanks for your call. I'm sure you know, he had a bit of resentment towards me for a while, but he never sh showed it. But um, we, we actually, um, the guys went to Adelaide, we won the game, the guys went to Adelaide to play, lost by 97 points in the first final uh, via the Adelaide Crows the week after. Mm -hmm. And I'd had a baby, and my second child, um, so I didn't go to Adelaide because we were going to have the baby that day. And so uh, we were in a, I met the guys at a pub on the Sunday and we are in the pub and, uh, locally, uh, locally yeah. in, in actually Albert Park, yeah. and I got a tap on the shoulder, and it was Tom Bell Chambers. I was with ten Essendon players, and he just said to me, "Look at the door." And <laughs> I looked at the door, and there was uh, uh, Jordan Lewis. Uh, I think it might have been Stewie Jew. Um, there was Brad, uh, not Brad Sewell, Luke Hodge, and they were all walking towards me. And I thought, "Oh no!" Yeah. And then Tom Bell Chambers said to me. Uh, we're here for you if anything breaks. Gee. He, um, so the last thing I wanted to happen, and Hodgie just put out his hand and said, um, I don't, did, don't like the way our club responded. Really? After that. Clarko obviously tried to get at me on the field. Um, Campbell Brown said I'm one of the biggest snipers in the game in a radio interview after the game. So it got really spiteful. I got six weeks yeah. early plea down the four, so it got quite nasty. But Hodgie said what happens on the field stays on the field. and. We probably were sore losers in a sense um, after that day, so we all moved on from there. Did you fear for your safety on the ground? I, I did, and um, but my, I said to myself, like, head over the ball, head over the ball. If you get some free kicks, if you get knocked out, so be it, because you just can't be you know, cowering away from um, any ball. So Chance Bateman knocked me out and got a week for it. He big round arm. I was seeing stars. I was able to play on. I might not have been able to play on in today's footy with um, what went on. And it was about five minutes to go and all the crowd was jeering me, booing me. And I could see this hostile environment happening where I thought to myself, should I run off and finish the last five minutes on the bench? Would Gee. be the safest place? And I thought, how cowardly would that look? So I thought I'll finish it off, got off the ground. And I was in such a haze that I, they gave me a footy at the end of the game to give to an Essendon supporter. I ran to the Hawthorne end and I had to try and find a, a kid in that crowd and then that's when I locked eyes with Alistair Clark. So on your way back to the Eston Huddle? Yeah, was, was, I was on my own. Yeah. There was Max Bailey had done his knee. Saul's face was caved in. Clarko's angry as Clarko can get and he just, I just lip read, you know, you better not. Uh, you know, expletives retire because we want to see you again next Gee. year, you know, and um, I had, to, and then I was in the shower after the game. I had um, David Calthorpe, who was our footy manager at the time, say, "Don't leave the rooms yet because we'll need to get your security escort out of there." So it was a really draining um, yeah. 24, 48 hours. You mentioned about Clarko, and yeah. we all know how angry and he can yeah. get, and how supportive he is of his players. Have you crossed paths with him since? So that same uh, period, oh nine. Uh, it was grand final week and I was actually doing a, a guest spot on before the game and Clarko happened to be on and we were in the green room. I didn't look to make any eye contact with him 
and uh, I was on first, so I, I went and did my spot on the show, pretty much grabbed my things, was heading out to my car, and I hear, Lloydie, Lloydie, and Clarko had run out to um, follow me out onto the street, and he just said, can I just say, um, he didn't say sorry, but he, he said, can I just say, in the heat of the moment, um, with Bailey's knee, Saul, I looked at a player that I really love and respect in Saul, and I saw him, then I saw you, We'd just been knocked out of the finals in the moment, just got all too much for me. And I, I wanted to square off with you, really. And I, I, I sometimes wonder, Mark Evans, who's now obviously the head honcho at the AFL, was pushing Clarko back, going, no, Clarko, no. So I often wonder, if Mark wasn't there on the spot, what, what would have happened, Shit. you know? If, if you know, Clarko could have just had the, the free reign to come to me, yeah. what could have broken out on a footy field there between a coach and a player? Do you regret the way that you left footy? Uh, well, that's a yeah. vivid and a yeah. brilliant recital of yeah. what happened. But you finished up as a bloke rubbed out for six weeks down yeah. to four and never played again. Uh, as I just said, Mike, um, you know, I regret what happened to Brad Sewell, but it's you have a split second yep. to make decisions. And I, I, um, I got the execution wrong. Um, but I've, I've laid many hip and shoulders where the execution was right. So, um, I, as I said, I executed the butt wrong, but okay. I don't regret it. How sad are you about the fate of your football club? Oh, well, I think that, um, you know, I, I made a point when I retired to remove myself as quickly as possible from wanting to be seen as an Essendon uh, former player because I wanted to be seen as a neutral. And, mm -hmm. and uh, but, so I, I did that and I, I wouldn't have gone back to the Essendon football club more than twice in, really? in five or six years. Yeah, I, I felt like I had my time. Yeah, you know, the place moves on. It's time to move on. What about and, the premiership reunion? Yeah, I, I um, it's a separate thing that we do every year, just the 22 players, and I, I see, do that every year, and I catch up with people. But I never went back to the footy club too often, and um, it was just something I decided to do. And, and uh, anyway, that was something that um, I, 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 my love for the club and my through all that really came back to say. I played in a club that we expected to play finals every year. Anything less than a pre prelim um, wasn't acceptable. I've seen a club now that hasn't played finals for 11 years. I'm oh, sorry, hasn't won a final for 11 years. And, um, and then is seen as drug cheats, players mm. losing careers. James Hurd, who's the most revered player in the history of the game, being seen, people forget about that now and just see him um, as, as a guy who organise um, this that's let down you know, all these players. Um, so you, before you leave that, yeah. do you think Hurdy's problem, an image problem, is self-inflicted or not? Oh, you, oh, he has to take full responsibility for that program as a senior coach, but I never, ever thought... Um, James' probably biggest failure is that he put too much responsibility as a young coach who had, didn't have any experience in other people. And, um, Are you talking about Stephen Dank? Stephen Dank, Dean uh, Robinson, Dean Robinson and, and also the people like who employed him, which you'd have to say is obviously um, Danny Corcoran, mm. Paul Hamilton. You know, they just didn't do their due diligence on Stephen Dank. And, um, so I think as a senior coach, you have to be across every detail. James obviously wasn't. Um, and he's paid a price. But to say he was looking to cheat... Um, and harm players, I won't cop that okay. because he's no, too, no, good of, too good oh, a No, person. I agree with that. Yeah. Now, you did actually play football. Yeah. <laughs> We've yeah. forgotten that yeah. a bit. 2000's obviously the highlight, you win the flag. What I was staggered about when I was having a look at your form that year, in 17 out of 25 games, you kicked four or more goals. I mean, if a coach knows that his key forward is going to guarantee, virtually guarantee four a week, that's a big big start. Yeah, it's, uh, I didn't realise that, that stat, Mike, but uh, I think... Um, yeah, through that period of 2000, 2001, and the one thing I always wanted to be known for is consistency. And I knew that um, somewhere along the line, I could break through and, you know, you know, it might be until the last quarter, but I'd find a way to break through and uh, perform for my team. And you know, mind you, we were a dominant team. Yep. We were having 70 inside 50. So, you know, some would say you should be having a return like that. But, um, you know, we, we had a star-studded side uh, that we played with. I was fortunate enough to play with, you know, long herd Lucas, McCurry, um, you know, at Buick as my you know, forwards mm. with me and then a midfield that batted pretty deep. So it was a great year. Two coaches only. Mm. I suspect that you view both of them differently. 
quite differently. Kevin yeah. Sheedy was your long-time coach and you finished with Matthew Knights. Yeah, I'll start with Sheeds. And um, Sheeds, I probably now respect him more than I did when I played because um, you know, I was probably a bit tired at the end of hearing the same voice for 13 years and I'll admit I was ready for a change at the 13-year mark. Um, but what he did do, which I didn't appreciate, was he always had me feeling like I was going to play a big game mm. every time I ran out. And um, and so you know, I'd have a poor game and he'd play psychology with you and he'd sometimes say, the selectors aren't sure, but hey, I'll, I'm with you, I'm with you. Hey, you'll get me five this week. And so he had me running out wanting to play for him most of the time and you know, he, he toughened me up, he, um, he pushed me to go and do media. So he was about you as a person, you as a footballer. He, when I first met him, he said, I want you to buy, own a house by the time you stop mm. playing. Like, so he was like a father figure in mm. a sense. He, he gave some great sprays, but at the same time, he'd always have you walking away feeling good at the end of it. But he did, didn't he give one to you that it was a while before you recovered from it? Oh, he told me at one stage, uh, you know, I wasn't attacking the ball hard enough that I was embarrassing not only myself, but the Essendon fans, your family who were here watching. But I reckon as soon as he said it, he wished he didn't say. Mm -hmm. So um, I just, you know, there was a stage, one of my first sessions at training where other players were taking balls on their chest. I started to do it because I, I was watching blokes I looked up to. He made me run 400s for the rest of the really? night. And he said, if you want to be a great forward, mark out in front. And it became a real weapon for me, marking yeah, out did. in front. You know, so um, just so I, I just um, didn't, as I said, appreciate him at the time because he's your coach and you see him every day. But now I can't be thankful enough for what he did for me as a player. There's not the same level of fondness for Matthew Knights, is there? No, no, there's not. Um, and, you know, it was a tough couple of years and... You know, and it's not all Matthew's fault. You know, I'll I'll take some of the blame in in the regard that Matthew came in, to, and I'd been coached by the one coach for 13 years, and he wanted to do things differently. Um, what I probably didn't like from Matthew uh, is that um, you see coaches come in, and I'll say to a Kane Corn say at Port Adelaide when Ken Hinckley came in, I'm here to extend your career if you do the right thing by me, and I saw teammates in Jason Johnson and Damien Peverell get told at round four that um, you're only going to play VFL footy for the rest of the year. So there was a, that, that didn't sit too well with me that, um, that these guys were rotting away really um, and that there wasn't probably a, the respect that they probably could have got. And then probably one by one I found like guys were being phased out um, you know, for a new era at Essendon. And, and that, younger, yeah, yeah. Yeah, for a younger era at Essendon. And, I probably started thinking, well, when's my time mm. coming? Um, and so we always res were respectful of each other. Um, and I never, ever badmouthed Matthew to any players or people because I, I wanted to win for Matthew Knights and I wanted it to be a successful time. So, um, you know, it become testy by the end of my last year and when I retired. What's um, that? What's testy mean? Oh, well, um, you know, in leadership meetings and things like that, that um, and then. You know, match game reviews, you know, he was um, directing a fair bit of his frustration towards me because he just wasn't happy with the way like I was face playing. face to face, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, um, and I, I probably, um, yeah, yeah, wasn't agreeing with the, you know, the way the team was playing at times and I wanted more buy-in to the game style, which he didn't want me to have. Um, so, you know, it was just, uh, he, he was just looking to do things differently and I saw things differently. I'm, I was opi I'm opinionated. I wanted to, uh, as still as captain of the club, um, have more of a joint uh, philosophy on how we can do things. But, um, I, you know, he, he probably saw it a different way. So I'll give him uh, credit. He was a brilliant coach at Bendigo and I was happy for him to take the job. He's doing... My brother's his boss now at, at Geelong, Geelong and he, he's doing a fantastic job at Geelong. But I think the, the pressure of replacing Kevin Sheedy mm. was tough on him. Um, exiting champions is never an easy thing to do. So I, I see what he was trying to do, but I just felt at times he didn't do things the right way. And there was friction definitely for a year or two between Matthew and I, but not anymore. You know, life's too short to have grudges um, in football and I definitely haven't got one towards Matthew.
Hey, Matty, it's a brilliant career by any definition, and I've just been fascinated by your recall of all the details and your honesty. Mm. Great to finally catch up. I mean, after you for yeah. about four <laughs> yeah. years, great to finally get in front yeah. of you. Thanks, Thanks Mike. Mate. It's great. Thanks. This has been a Fox Footy production. Part of the Fox Sports Network.